Hello and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective. And today we're looking at Veronica Roth's Divergent. It's chapters one to three. That's right, we're starting a new book and I am loving slash hating it so far. (laughs) I just have so many questions like, number one, how did this get published? (laughs) Like, I see how it got published because there's some things that are quite enjoyable about it. You know, it's dystopian, it's kids fighting, it's very Hunger Games. Like, this came out, like, I think after the Hunger Games when everyone had Hunger Games fever. But, like, I think the Hunger Games are better books because at least that society is well thought out. This one. Ugh. Like, can we believe that kids would go into arena and kill each other to the death because, you know, bread and circus, all that bullshit? Yeah, we can believe that. I feel like we can get on board with that. This social structure, I can just, I cannot picture it. It does not make any sense. We'll unpack it as we move along. But when I was reading this, I was like, surely not. Surely no one thought this was a good idea, but Veronica thought it was a great idea. And apparently she wrote this book in a month and you can tell, but let's get into it. And right away, like before even the first page of the first chapter, we are just getting spoilers. (laughs) Just so many spoilers. So the the dedication, it says to my mother who gave me the moment when Beatrice realizes how strong her mother is and wonders how she missed it for so long. So, okay. So we already know that her mother's going to be like a strong character that's unexpected. So if there's a plot twist to come where surprise her mother is something different than what she thought her mother was the whole time. Well, we already know that. I don't know why she would spoil that before the first chapter. And then there's a contents page. And instead of naming the chapters on the contents page, it just has like the first line of each chapter. So chapter one, it says, there is one mirror in my house. It is behind dot, dot, dot. Chapter two, the test begins after lunch. We sit at the long dot, dot, dot. And I was like, okay, what's the point of this? Like, I imagine most people would see that and like not bother to read it. Cause it's like, well, why do I need to read the first line of every chapter? all in one go. Doesn't make sense. But if you were the type of person to read it through, like I am, there's all these little spoilers and hints at what's to come. So like chapter 10, that night I dreamed that Christina hangs from the railing. Okay. So something's going down with Christina. Chapter 19, when I walk in, most of the other initiates, Dauntless born. Okay. So she's going to pick Dauntless. The whole first few chapters were like, oh, what faction is she going to pick? What faction is it? Well, it's Dauntless apparently, according to the contents page. And then the worst one is chapter 39, which is the last chapter. It says, the shot doesn't come. He stares at me with the dot, dot, dot. And I'm like, okay, well, I I already know now that in chapter 38, it's going to end with like a gunshot. Someone's going to pull a gun and you'll be led to believe like that she's getting shot point blank. But then next, next page, oh, that there wasn't actually a bullet in the gun. Like I know that from the contents page. Why is she spoiling us? So let's get into it. I mean, we know where we know the trajectory of the book. She's going to pick Dauntless. Someone's going to shoot at her, but they're not loaded or something like that's what's going to happen here. I know Christine is going to be dangling off something. And there's also some guy called Tobias. So the chapter starts with, there is one mirror in my house. And it's like a hidden mirror behind a sliding panel. And she says, our faction allows me to stand in front of it on the second day of every third month, the day my mother cuts my hair. So, okay. So they're only allowed to look into the mirror once a month that I can get on board with, but who came up with the idea that it has to be on the second day of every third month? Like that's, that's hard to track, you know, like second Tuesday of the month. I'm sure. But it's, it's, it's the second day of every third month. Doesn't seem very practical at all. Does it? Like who's going to remember that? And she says the faction allows that. So the faction's pretty much determining that, Everybody can only have a haircut every three months. How that's policed, I'm not sure. Uh, if, the, if the mirror lives there hidden behind a sliding panel, just, just go and check in on it every now and then. So her mum's given her a haircut. <laughs> she says, I note how calm she looks and how focused she is. She is well practiced in the art of losing herself. Well, I already know from the dedication that there's more to her than that. And she's sneaking a look at her reflection. <laughs> when her mum isn't paying attention. And she says, not for the sake of vanity, but out of curiosity, a lot can happen to a person's appearance in three months. I just think it's because all these books, all these poorly written books like to start with a mirror shot because that's the only way that they can think to describe the character's appearance to the reader. 
Fifty Shades of Grey started the same way, looking in a mirror. So this chick, she's got a narrow face, wide, round eyes, and a long, thin nose. Doesn't sound very attractive when you put it like that. So she says she's newly 16, but they don't celebrate birthdays in this faction. The other factions do, but for this faction, it would be too self-indulgent. So they don't celebrate birthdays. <sighs> See, my main, my main problem is, it turns out that you get to pick what faction you want to belong to when you turn 16 or in your 16th year or whatever. Why would anyone want to be this faction? The faction where you can't stare in a mirror unless it's the third day of every second month or the second day of every third month. (laughs) And you can't celebrate birthdays or get spontaneous haircuts. Who's choosing that faction? And so apparently today is the day of the aptitude test that will show her which of the five factions she belongs in. And then tomorrow it's the choosing ceremony where she decides on a faction. So if it's a choice, why do you need an aptitude test to tell you which one you belong in? Ugh. And also, isn't it a coincidence that haircut day is the very same day as aptitude test day? So they must make aptitude day the second day of every 12th month. She says, I will decide on a faction. I will decide the rest of my life. I will decide to stay with my family or abandon them. Crazy, crazy. You can't even visit your old family in a different faction. And like to call it a choosing ceremony and to have the front cover of this book all be like one choice determines your future. There's so much emphasis on the choice, but I'm like, is it really a free choice if they're blackmailing you and leveraging like your whole 16 years of existence, your whole family, your whole social network up against changing factions? Like that doesn't really seem like it's a free choice, which is probably why nobody really chooses that different except for this character because she's special. Oh, wait till we get into how this character's special somehow. Oh my God. So then she tells us that her mother is actually really pretty, but she has to hide that beauty because she's in abnegation. So that's the name of their faction, abnegation, which is just a horrible word to say. So abnegation, it means the action of renouncing or rejecting something. Imagine building a whole faction around rejecting things that make you feel good. And so she goes to the kitchen, her brother's cooking breakfast, her dad's there reading the newspaper and her mother's humming at the table. And she says, it's on mornings like this that I feel the guiltiest for wanting to leave them. Babe, don't feel guilty. I'm pretty sure everyone else in that position would feel the exact same way. And then new scene, we're on a bus. (laughs) And (laughs) it sounds like whatever dystopia they're in, the roads aren't great because there's lots of uneven pavement that's jostling her and she has to grip the seat to to not go flying about on the bus. And then her older brother, Caleb, he's standing in the aisle because he gave up his seat for someone else because, you know, he's selfless. He's in abnegation, so he's selfless. She says he gave his seat to a surly candor man on the bus without a second thought. (laughs) I tell you what, if I was in any of the other factions, I would be using that to my advantage. I'd be like, oh, hey, abnegation guy, give me a seat. And they'd, they'd have to say yes. They'd have to do whatever they want because they have to be selfless. And Candor, I think I said Candor earlier, which, <laughs> excuse me. So Candor, this Candor guy, apparently they wear black and white. <laughs> That's their standard uniform color palette because their faction values honesty and sees the truth as black and white. So that is what they wear. You gotta be shitting me. You got to be shitting me. That don't make a lick of sense. But now nah, they, they say things in black and white, so they're going to dress in black and white. <laughs> And the, uh, the book is just so on the nose. So apparently it's set in Chicago, future Chicago. And she says, we ride towards a building near the heart of the city. The building that was once called the Sears Tower, we call it the hub, emerges from the fog, a black pillar in the skyline. And my thing is like, would this character know that it used to be called the Sears Tower? I feel like, the, you know, they must have had this sort of revolution post-apocalyptic society for... A fair few decades and she's young, but she, she knows what, <laughs> what the, what the old name is for that building. And I feel like she's just trying to tip to the reader being like, it's Sears Tower by, by literally telling us, Hey, this was Sears Tower. And I'm like, can't you just like hint at that and drop little clues? I don't know why you have to make it so obvious it sort of takes away from the power of being in a world that's similar to our own, but not our own because you, you're just pointing it out. And then she says their bus passes underneath an elevated train track. And she says, I've never been on a train, though they never stop running and there are tracks everywhere. 
only the Dauntless ride them. So that's a, that's a third faction that we're hearing about. And so you're telling me that there's a whole public transport system that only one fifth of the people can actually ride. If, if there's these trains with train tracks everywhere, why are candor and abnegation stuck on the bus? The rickety crickety bus where there's not enough seats for everybody. But what is this detail where she says they never stop running? How is that economical? Surely between the hours of like midnight and 6 a.m. you can maybe do a reduced schedule, maybe stop them for a bit. But no, they they never stop running. And the thing is, they don't actually stop to let people off. So the Dauntless, they're brave, by the way. That's their one defining feature. They're brave. They have to like jump on and jump off with the with the train still moving. What an odd system. And she tells us that five years ago, volunteer construction workers from Abnegation, because, you know, they have to do all the shit jobs, apparently. They repaved some of the roads, but what they did was they started in the middle of the city and worked their way outwards until they ran out of materials. (laughs) So the roads where she lives are still cracked and patchy, and it's not safe to drive on them. (laughs) So maybe it's not a good idea to relegate all your council construction work to the selfless society. Maybe, maybe there's a different faction that are a bit handier who have skills at actually planning out road maintenance where they, <laughs> where their strategy doesn't depend on start in the middle and work your way outwards until you run out of materials. Like maybe you should have gotten a faction that's a bit better than abnegation to do that important work, maybe. And then she's looking at Caleb, who's just hanging onto the pole, hanging on for dear life because... <laughs> because the roads are so bad, because shitty abnegation did a bad job at retiring the pavement. So he's trying to balance. And she can tell that he's looking at everyone around him. And she says, probably striving to see only them and to forget himself. Candor values honesty, but our faction abnegation values selflessness. Like, okay, that's been established. We pretty much hammered that point home, but thanks for the reminder. Because yeah, it is a lot to take in. So I will accept the reminder. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, and then the bus stops. She goes to get off, but her pants are too long. Well, she calls them slacks, but I'm going to call them pants. Her pants are too long and she stumbles over the candy guy's shoes. And she says, I've never been that graceful. Which, is this just a trope? Is this just a trope that every bad book I read has to have a character that's not graceful? It's like they all went to like, well, I'm not going to say writing school, but maybe they all read like a writing tips blog that said, make your character relatable by having them be clumsy. And they all just signed up to that trope. But also she's telling us that she's never been that graceful. And I have seen the movie like 10 years ago or whenever it came out, I did see the movie and like, yeah, she does end up doing fight scenes and like all this fight choreography and jumping off buildings. And I don't think they bring up the whole fact that she's not graceful ever again. I'm willing to bet that after this one throwaway comment, she's, she's completely fine. She's no longer clumsy. And then, so they're at the hub, AKA Sears Tower. <laughs> that's their school? Or, or they're in a building that's close to the Sears Tower? I don't know. I guess they're in a hub of buildings. And the upper levels building is the oldest of the three schools in the city. And then there's like a lower level and then a mid-level school. What? And she says, like all the other buildings around it, it's made of glass and steel. In front is a large metal sculpture that the Dauntless climb after school, daring each other to go higher and higher. <laughs> okay. Dauntless are bored out of their brains if they're just thinking of little, little games to prove how brave they are. Get a hobby, Dauntless. And she says, last year I watched one of them fall and break her leg. <laughs> so what, what, why are they walking up a, a sculpture? What purpose does that serve? So they walk in. She explains that Caleb is a little bit older than her, but not quite a year older than her. So they're both in this category of the new recruits doing the aptitude test. And so she walks in. She says, the atmosphere feels hungry. Like every 16 year old is trying to devour as much as he can get of his last day. Like, what are they going to get killed? It's not your last day, guys. All of you are going to pick your own factions anyway. It's really quite the moot point. And she says, after the choosing ceremony, once we choose, our new factions will be responsible for finishing our education. Which makes me think if they have to then go and have like another set of education years after this, why, why are we doing the choosing ceremony now? Why wouldn't we have done that earlier or later? Is it like going to university and this is their high school graduation? 
But she says, our classes are cut in half today, so we will attend all of them before the aptitude tests, which take place after lunch. <laughs> well, if it's the last day of school, why are you bothering with the half classes? And, and why are you having the aptitude tests at lunch? Just have them in the morning. But now nah, Caleb's going to advanced math and she's going towards faction history. <laughs> Just to cram in a last couple of lesson plans b- before they choose a faction at lunch and then go on their merry way. This is what I'm saying. It's just, it's not a well thought out society. None of it tracks. And then she says, how do I tell him I've been worried for weeks about what the aptitude test will tell me? Abnegation, candor, erudite, amity, or dauntless. So there are the five factions. She just slipped in erudite and amity in there just, you know, to keep us on our toes. Dumb names for factions. And like half of them are adjectives, half of them are nouns. There's just no consistency even in the naming of them. But basically, it's abnegation is the selfless people. Candor are the ones that see truth as black and white. Erudite are the knowledgeable ones. (laughs) Amity are the kind ones, which is different to the selfless ones, apparently. And then there's dauntless that are the brave ones. I really think you could lump in amity and abnegation. That's just my two cents. And also erudite and candor could be pretty mixed as well. It just seems a weird five bunch of qualities to build a society off of. And then she walks towards faction history, chewing on her lower lip, another trope. She's just cramming in all the tropes. She's just Bella swanning about as she goes to faction history. And she says the hallways are cramped. These are one of the only places where the factions mix at our age. Well, I just read about you tripping over a candy guy's shoes on the bus. Like, clearly you guys mix. You saw a dauntless fall off of a statue. Like, you guys mix. I, okay, no, it's just in these hallways. It's just in the hallways. <laughs> and then an erudite boy in a blue sweater. I guess they're all color coded. The way that she can tell everyone apart, they must all be color coded. So erudite must wear blue. He, he pushes her. And she loses her balance and falls on the ground. So yeah, she's not graceful. And he says, out of my way, stiff. So just because he's knowledgeable doesn't mean he can be kind as well. If he was kind, he'd be an amity, but he's not kind. He's just knowledgeable. That's his one trait. (laughs) And she gets up. No one helps her up. She says, this sort of thing has been happening to others in my faction for months now. The erudite have been releasing antagonistic reports about abnegation. And it has begun to affect the way we relate at school. So there's faction wars. Who would have thought? Like my whole idea is that they set up this society of five different factions to cohabit and get along and rebuild. But like, well, no, of course, when you divide people up into fifths, they're going to have quarrels. Of course. How can this society function? It cannot And she says the gray clothes, the plain hairstyle, all these things are meant to make it easier for me to forget myself and easier for everyone else to forget me too. But now they make me a target. Oh, it's almost as if dressing people up in different clothes and dividing them into different personality stereotypes is just like a way of dividing people. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? And it's at this point where the Dauntless prove their bravery by jumping from a moving train. So she sits there at the window watching as the train comes and they all just jump off it and the train doesn't stop because the train, the trains here just never stop. And apparently their primary purpose is to guard the fence that surrounds their city. From what? She doesn't know. She doesn't know what they're, what they're defending the city from, but that's their job. And they wear black clothes and they're all tattooed and pierced. So it must be like a little initiation thing where if you go into Dauntless, you have to get a tattoo. And so the train goes past and then there's a mass exodus of young people in dark clothing, hurling themselves from the moving cars, some dropping and rolling, others stumbling before regaining their balance. There must be a lot of injuries in Dauntless, but you can tell she's fascinated. She clearly wants to be a Dauntless because I, I guess... She likes piercings, tattoos, and jumping off of a train because that's all there is that she knows because they keep them all separate. But she turns away. She says, watching them is a foolish practice. So then she heads back to her faction history classroom. And that's the end of the first chapter. These chapters are quite short. So let's smash through a couple of them. Now let's go on to chapter two. Okay, so chapter two, she says, the tests begin after lunch. Yes, that's been established. Thank you for the reminder. 
So they're all sitting in the cafeteria waiting for the administrators to call them 10 at a time. She's sitting next to Caleb and their neighbor, Susan. So apparently Susan's father, he travels throughout the city for his job. So he has a car and, and drives her to and from school, but they always refuse lifts because they don't want to be an inconvenience. It's like, oh God, you abnegation people are so boring. It's insufferable how selfless you are. And apparently the test administrators are all abnegation volunteers, except for one erudite um, and one dauntless because they need to test the abnegation people because abnegation can't test abnegation. It just really does seem like abnegation are getting all the shit jobs in this society. And I love how they're like, oh, we've got to be fair. We can't have abnegation testing abnegation. And it's like, well, I thought they have a choice afterwards. So does the test really matter? And so she looks over, there's the dauntless table and they're all laughing, shouting and playing cards because nothing says courageous <laughs> like playing cards. And then the erudite, they're sitting at their table chatting over books and newspapers because they're all in constant pursuit of knowledge. If you're erudite, you always have to be constantly in pursuit of knowledge. But my thing is like, there's people who were born erudite who don't stay as erudite once they have the fake choice to leave erudite. So what if they're not interested in books and knowledge? Are they just pretending for 16 years? Is this a whole like nature versus nurture debate? Because I do not want to get into that. And then she looks over, there's a group of Amity girls. They're all wearing yellow because that's the kind color. Like just say Hufflepuffs, Veronica, just say Hufflepuffs. And I was thinking, oh, how do you demonstrate a kind activity? What are they doing? They're playing a hand slapping game involving a rhyming song. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then at the table next to them, there's Kanda. We all know they're wearing black and white. Ridiculous. And they appear to be arguing about something, but, it, but it's not serious because some of them are still smiling. So yes, because they're Kanda, they're obviously having a knowledgeable debate. Even though Erudite's the one that seeks knowledge, Kanda just seeks truth. Like, what's the difference? And at the abnegation table, they're just sitting there quietly. Ah, oh, those poor abnegation people. And so then Caleb's name's called. So he goes to do the test and she tells us that he should be really self-assured in, in himself. He's always known where he belongs and where he wants to be. He shouldn't be nervous. And the way she's really laying it on thick, I'm like, okay, so he's clearly going to choose to be something else. And she says, I tried to explain to him that my instincts are not the same as his. And she says, it didn't even enter my mind to give my seat to the candor man on the bus. Oh, so that just proves that she's, she's not abnegation, right? Just because she didn't give her seat up for some dickhead on the bus. So she just sits there with her eyes closed for 10 minutes until Caleb comes back. <laughs> God, poor abnegation, so boring. And she opens her mouth to ask him something, but then she's like, oh, I'm not allowed to ask him about his results and he's not allowed to tell me. And I'm like, well, then why are they being funneled back into the cafeteria after they do the test? Go home, put them in a separate area. Don't let him mingle in the cafeteria if he's not allowed to talk about it. So then her name's called. Apparently it's Beatrice Pryor. This is the first we're hearing her name. We didn't know her name for the whole first chapter, but now she's Beatrice Pryor, which what a horrible, boring name. Like no wonder she changes it later in the book. And she tells us, I get up because I'm supposed to. <laughs> well, like, yeah, okay. And so she's like really nervous about the test. And I was like, why? You can ignore the results of the test and pick whatever you want. It's your choice, apparently. So she says, waiting for us outside the cafeteria is a row of 10 rooms. They are used only for the aptitude tests. So I have never been in one before. Doesn't seem very economical to have, <laughs> to have these 10 rooms in prime location at the cafeteria when they're only used for one day a year. That's prime real estate just going to waste. Oh, and unlike the other rooms in the school, they are separated not by glass, but by mirrors. So she watches herself, pale and terrified, walking towards one of the doors. So she could just walk down this corridor whenever she wants, if she actually wants to see her reflection. <laughs> but you know, there's this hidden mirror in her house and she can only see herself every second day of the third month, but she could just come up to this corridor at school and just check herself out. So she goes into a room. There's a dauntless woman waiting for her to do the tests. And she's wearing a black blazer because she's got to wear black. Oh, and she's also got a tattoo on the back of her neck, which is a black and white hawk with a red eye. Black and white might be a candor hawk. 
So apparently in the center of the room, there's like a dentist's chair and the dauntless chick, her name's Tori. She says, have a seat. And so she sits down, Tori's fiddling with some machine that must run the test. And she says, why the hawk? So yeah, she's, she's asking about the tattoo. And Tori says, never met a curious abnegation before. So already like we've got hints that she's special because she asked a question. And like, you're telling me that none of the abnegation are, are curious. How does that work out? Or they're all curious, but they never voice their curiosity. And that's just something that they all do. They all do. But like, never met a curious abnegation before. Where do you meet? We already know that you guys don't interact. You're out, you're out like manning the perimeter, aren't you? But no, I've never met a curious abnegation. So you only meet the 16 year olds every year when you do these tests. And they were born into abnegation. They didn't choose abnegation. They're not abnegation. Oh, never mind. And she says, in some parts of the ancient world, the hawk symbolized the sun. Back when I got this, I figured if I always had the sun on me, I wouldn't be afraid of the dark. My question is, then why wouldn't you just get a tattoo of the sun? (laughs) No, she got a tattoo of a hawk because it represents the sun because she's afraid of the dark. How does does a tattoo of a hawk help you see at night? And she says, oh, you're afraid of the dark. So even though she just got called out for being a curious abnegation, she's asking more questions. And she says, no, I was afraid of the dark. So the hawk tattoo worked. If any of you out there listening are parents and you have a kid that's afraid of the dark, don't get them a nightlight. Just tattoo a hawk on their bodies and they'll be fine. Meanwhile, she's attaching like electrodes and wires to her. Who knows what this test is? It seems pretty far-fetched. Like, you know what? What's wrong with the multiple choice answer booklet? Maybe just like a, a question and answer, free form speech segment, like, like just, just ask a few questions. But no, they've got to go through this like virtual reality simulated IR bullshit where she's going to get attached to a dentist chair full of electrodes and wires. What? Oh no, but first she has to drink a vial of clear liquid. So they, they're doping her up in order for her to have these hallucinations triggered by this machine. So you're telling me that this society has this whole like system where people need to be hooked up to a machine and then have some LSD so they can have this like group hallucination telling them what their personality is like, just like really advanced technology and they can't even pave their roads properly. And they don't even know how to stop trains. (laughs) What? And so she, she drinks the vial of liquid. And then when she opens her eyes, I guess it's instant because she's somewhere else. She's back in the cafeteria, but it's empty and it's now snowing. And on the table in front of her are two baskets. In one, there's a hunk of cheese. And in the other, there's a knife the length of her forearm. And the woman says, choose. And she says, why? (laughs) Great question. And she says, choose. And she's like, ugh. She's like, what, what do I want cheese on a knife for? And she's like, um, bitch, choose. And it's like, okay, Beatrice, this is clearly the test. Like, just pick one. <laughs> she's like, wow, well, well, I don't want to have to pick one. And like, the answer's cheese. <laughs> I don't care if you want to be erudite, gander, um, negation, amity, dauntless. You pick the cheese. But now she doesn't choose, which I guess is, you know, a big deal. And then she turns around and she sees a dog. And the dog's like growling and snarling at her. And she's like, ah, I see now why the cheese would have come in handy. Or the knife, now that I think about it. It's like, babe, you're in a simulation. Like, does it really matter? Then she's like, what do I do? I can't run. The dog will be faster. I can't wrestle it to the ground. I don't know why not. And she's like, oh, I have to make a decision. If I can jump over one of the tables, I could use it as a shield. No, I can't do that. And then the dog's snarling and she's like, what do I do? And she goes, oh, my biology textbook said that dogs can smell fear because of a chemical secreted by human glands in a state of duress. The same chemical a dog's prey secretes. Is that real? But it's like, hey, you're in a dentist's chair. I don't think this is a real dog that can smell your glands. Just make a fucking decision and let the test proceed. But she must have all the time in the world because then she's thinking, oh, what do I know about dogs? And she's thinking about how you shouldn't look a dog in the eyes. She's thinking about this time in her childhood when she wanted to pet some other dog and her dad was like, don't pet that dog. And I was like, what? Just, just do something. 
So she decides to just get down on her knees and then lie down on the ground in front of the dog. And then she stretches her legs out and leans on her elbows and the dog comes closer and then the dog starts licking her face. So she, she really did nothing at all. For, for a test that's based on choices, she didn't do the first choice. And instead of doing anything, this one, she just lied down. How is this determining what faction she should belong to? And then because the dog's being all friendly, she's like, oh, I'm suddenly glad I didn't pick up the knife. Well, what were you going to do? Stab it just because you picked the knife doesn't mean you have to kill the dog. And then she blinks and then there's a kid in a white dress running over towards the puppy. And she's like, what the hell are you doing? And then the dog's about to pounce onto the kid. So she jumps onto the dog and like wraps her arms around its neck, I guess trying to like choke the dog out or something. But then the dog disappears and so does the girl. And now she's alone in the testing room. And then she goes out the door and then suddenly she's on a bus and all the seats are taken. And so there's this guy sitting there with a newspaper and he's got all these burned hands and he's like pretty creepy. And he says to her, do you know this guy pointing at a picture of someone in the newspaper? And the headline reads, brutal murderer finally apprehended. And she says, it has been a long time since I last read that word murderer, but even its shape fills me with dread. So it's like, you're afraid of the shape of the word. And I guess she's saying that in this society, there are no murders. How that's the case, I'm, I'm not too sure. And even if there aren't murders, like I'm sure there's a lot of deaths from people jumping off of trains that don't stop. And so she looks at the photo of the person in the newspaper and she thinks she might know him. And he's like, do you know him? Do you know him? And she's like, oh, it might be a bad idea to tell him. So she finally, after a lot of deliberation, makes a choice and she says, no, no, I don't have any idea who he is. <laughs> and she's like, it's just a test. I shouldn't be afraid of him. But like, you're kind of just telling the truth. You, you don't know who he is. You had a vague feeling that you might know him. So it's like, this is a shit test if you don't actually know the guy. If it was a photo of like your dad or something, then that would have been like fun. That would have been like an actual moral choice, whether you say something or not. But no, you, you don't actually know who this guy is. So like, yeah, you don't know him. Just Mariah Carey that. I don't know her. Anyway, then this creepy guy, he's like, you're lying, you're lying. And then he says, if you know him, you could save me. You could save me. And at this point, she's like, well, fuck you. And she says, well, I don't. And that's the end of chapter two. Tell you what, these chapters blink and you'll miss them. And so chapter three, she wakes to sweaty palms and a pang of guilt in her chest. And uh, yeah, I already read that back in the contents page. And so she's lying back in the dentist chair in the mirror room. And there's Tori. Tori's like, what the hell? And Tori's detaching the wires and she's looking strange. And she says, that was perplexing. Excuse me, I'll be right back. And so she leaves. (laughs) And so she's left sitting there being like, how the hell do you fail a test that you can't even prepare for? Well, maybe by not making any decisions throughout the whole fricking simulation. No wonder she's having a hard time figuring out what faction you belong in. You didn't do anything. And it's at this point that I got so confused because I'm like, Tori, like surely over all the years, you've also had other people who refused to make decisions or had conflicting tests. Like it's just human nature to be five different qualities all at once. <laughs> like, Right. But no, but no, apparently there's people who are factionless. So that's her fear. She's like, what if Tori comes back and she tells me that I'm not cut out for any faction, that I would have to live on the streets with the factionless. She says, I can't do that. To live factionless is not just to live in poverty and discomfort. It is to live divorced from society, separated from the most important thing in life, community. I don't know if community is the most important thing in life, but okay. But apparently there's just this whole group of factionless people who just are homeless. And I don't know how that can be. How can, how can someone be neither brave, nor kind, nor smart, nor honest, or selfless? Like surely, surely you'd scrape into one of those categories at a pinch. At a pinch, you'd be able to fake your way into one of them, or at least stick with the one that you were raised in. Like this bitch, all for two chapters, she's been telling us that she's not really much of an abnegation because she doesn't have the selfless gene and yet she's in abnegation. Just pretend to be selfless. How are these factionless people not pretending to care about the truth? And like candor, that's the easiest one to fake. Just be like, oh, I I appreciate honesty. And they'll be like, whoop, you're in. (laughs) So if I'm this homeless guy in post-apocalyptic Chicago with the shit roads, I'd just be like, oh, hey, candor. Don't you love the truth? And they'll be like, yeah, 
And I'll be like, me too. And they'll be like, well, come on in. But now we've just got a whole society full of homeless people that apparently are bad people because they don't belong to a faction. Oh, that's dumb. And she says, my mother once told me that without a faction, we have no purpose and no reason to live, which is pretty rough to homeless people. Pretty bloody rough to be saying that they don't have a reason to live. So then the door opens and Tori walks back in. And Tori's like, yeah, sorry to worry you, but she looks all tense and pale. So she's not doing a good job at acting cool. And she says, Beatrice, your results were inconclusive. Typically, each stage of the simulation eliminates one or more of the factions. But in your case, only two have been ruled out. (gasps) So she can be up to three factions. Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? And how did they rule out two so quickly? She only made one decision. I guess she's not candid because she didn't tell the truth. But like, okay, so if that's the case and and every simulation starts with cheese or a knife, like what are you ruling out if you pick cheese? I guess what, dauntless? Because you didn't pick the knife. But what are you ruling out if you picked the knife instead of the cheese? What what faction belongs to the cheese? Amity? (laughs) I, I don't know. Do only the erudites pick cheese? Like what, who's picking the cheese? And also I think it's a bit of a cop out because I thought the whole point of her being divergent was that she could be all five of them. And like, that's why she's special. But no, she's only, she's only three out of five. <laughs> oh wait, no. So she tells us, she tells us about the cheese and knife type situation. She says, if you had shown an automatic distaste for the knife and selected the cheese, then the simulation would have led you to a different scenario that confirmed your aptitude for amity. So if you pick cheese, you must be a kind person. What the fuck? And she says that didn't happen, which is why Amity is out. So wait, just because she didn't select the cheese, Amity isn't it. What? God, this is really, really, I'm really struggling. I'm really struggling with this. So if you pick the cheese, you must be Amity. Pretty much is what she's saying. So you're telling me that Abnegation's picking the knife? Erudite's picking the knife? Oh, none of it makes sense. She says, normally the simulation progresses in a linear fashion, isolating one faction by ruling out the rest. The choices you made didn't even allow Candor, the next possibility, to be ruled out. What? That should be the one that is ruled out because she lied. Oh, wait, no, she says, so I had to alter the simulation to put you on the bus. And there, your insistence upon dishonesty ruled out Candor. And she says, don't worry about that. Only the Candor tell the truth in that one. Really? Really? Or are they only candor because of how they responded? It's not, they only responded that way because they candor. The whole, the whole setup is flawed. I'm sorry to tell you, Tori, but this is just a silly, silly thing, especially because they get to choose what faction they want to be in afterwards. It it has no bearing on anything. Veronica just thought it would be a fun little twist to start a little dystopia. No, Tori contradicts herself straight away. She says, oh, actually, that's not really true. People who tell the truth are candor and abnegation. So, so she just, so she just lied to us by saying only can to tell the truth. And why are we trusting her? Because she's dauntless. So she can lie. I'd only be trusting a candor in this type of situation or an abnegation, apparently. Oh, she says, on the one hand, you threw yourself on the dog rather than let it attack the little girl, which is an abnegation oriented response. Sure. But if she had the knife or the cheese, it'd be a different ball game. So like, how, how is that not factoring into the dog? And then she says, on the other hand, when you didn't tell the truth to that man, that's not an abnegation oriented response. So the people are multifaceted. That's what you're telling me. Not running from the dog suggests dauntless, but so does taking the knife, which you didn't do. Well, apparently you can be four different factions if you take the knife. This is so silly. She says, your intelligent response to the dog indicates strong alignment with the erudite. I have no idea what to make of your indecision in stage one. So everyone else, everyone else picks something. She's the only indecisive one. Maybe there needs to be a six faction that's just called indecisive. Oh, so she says, you know what? My conclusion is you display equal aptitude for abnegation, dauntless and erudite. Although the only thing she did that was erudite-ish was lying down in front of the dog, which I don't think was very smart. You're lying down in front of an a dog that's attacking you? How is that the knowledgeable response? And then she says, people who get this kind of result are, and then she looks over her shoulder and then she looks over her other shoulder and she says, are called dot, 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 in italics, divergent. 
And Beatrice says, she says the last word so quietly that I almost don't hear it. So, I mean, it's also the title of the book. So we were all, we were already primed to register the divergent was an important word, but she really hammered it home with the italics and the dot, dot, dots and, and the looking behind a shoulder. And she says, Beatrice, under no circumstances should you share this information with anyone. And she's like, yeah, I know. We're not meant to share our results. And she goes, no, this is different. I don't mean you shouldn't share them now. I mean, you should never share them with anyone ever, no matter what. Divergence is extremely dangerous. You understand? (sighs) How so? (laughs) How How is everyone not divergent? She's not even five out of five. Are you telling me that there's not people out there that aren't three out of five as well? And is like the subtext that the only reason she's getting away with this is because we've got this dauntless person that doesn't want to listen to rules. Like if it was an abnegation person finding a divergent person, would they just kill him? Is that what would happen? And she says, I don't understand. How could inconclusive test results be dangerous? Great fucking question. How can someone who's divergent be that dangerous? So she's selfless and brave and smart, even though She's already demonstrated to us that she's not selfless because she didn't get up for that bastard on the bus. So maybe we didn't need the test. Maybe we already knew that she wasn't a good abnegation candidate. So this Tory chick, she's like, how about you go home? I'll go tell your brother that's waiting for you that you've left. And she's like, oh, geez, okay. And she's like, I can't bear to think about the choosing ceremony tomorrow. And she says, well, it's my choice now, no matter what the test says. Abnegation, dauntless, erudite, divergent. It's like, yeah, the the choice is yours. Who gives a shit what the test says? So she says she decides not to take the bus because if she gets home early, her father will notice when he checks the house log at the end of the day and she'll have to explain. What's this house log? It sounds like, again, advanced technology for a house on a street with no road. So she decides to walk. And she says, I walk in the middle of the road. The buses tend to hug the curb, so it's safer here. In what world? is walking in the middle of the road safe. And she says, in some streets, I can see yellow lines in the middle of the road. We have no use for them now that there are so few cars and we don't need stoplights either. But in some places they dangle precariously over the road. Yeah, um, maybe maybe someone could fix that. (laughs) Maybe we could get an abnegation on the scene and um, maybe do some more road works. Sounds, Sounds like a hellscape. This is a society with traffic lights dangling precariously over the road and roads that don't work and trains that don't stop. But we've also got this little LSD mind trip choosing ceremony dentist chair. I'm not, I'm not matching those two things together. That's really confusing to me. And she says renovation moves slowly throughout the city. It's a patchwork of new clean buildings and old crumbling ones. Most of the new buildings are next to the marsh which used to be a lake a long time ago. So what is that, Lake Michigan? Lake Michigan's just all dried up. Interesting. I'm surprised Veronica didn't tell us, like, that's Lake Michigan, wink, wink, (laughs) like she did with the Sears Tower. She says, the abnegation volunteer agency my mother works for is responsible for most of those renovations. So abnegation are the renovators. (sighs) And I ask you guys, have you ever met a selfless tradie? Because I haven't. Have you ever invited a plumber over and they've done the job for free? No. I'm sorry, I might be being stereotypical here and just lumping everyone into categories, which is what this book does, but I just don't think of tradespeople as selfless. (laughs) Is anybody selfless though? Is any, any occupation made up of selfless people? Like maybe doctors, maybe, but they, they get very well compensated. I don't know. I'm treading into weird territory here. This book's making my brain think weird. She says, when I look at the abnegation lifestyle as an outsider, I think it's beautiful. When I watch my family move in harmony, when we go to dinner parties and everyone cleans together without having to be asked. (laughs) When I see Caleb help other strangers carry their groceries, I fall in love with this way of life. You, You guys are the punching bags. And she says, but when I try to live it myself, I have trouble. It never feels genuine. Well, the test said you're one third abnegation. So you probably should feel a bit more of an affinity. And she says, but choosing a different faction means I forsake my family permanently. Super rough. So if she were just to go and choose Dauntless, she'd never see her parents again. And she says, just near the part of the city where the abnegation live, 
There's like a stretch of places where the road has completely collapsed, revealing sewer systems and empty subways that she has to be careful of. She says, this is where the factionless live. She says, because they failed to complete initiation into whatever faction they chose, they live in poverty, doing the work no one else wants to do. Okay. Even, even abnegation don't want to do these jobs. She says, they are janitors and construction workers and garbage collectors. They make fabric and operate trains and drive buses. In return for their work, they get food and clothing. But as my mother says, not enough of either. <sighs> so, okay. That's pretty, that's pretty offensive to blue collar workers, isn't it? Um, and also like construction workers. I thought you were just telling us abnegation were doing all the road works, but now it's the factionless that are doing these jobs. Uh, and also they're the ones that operate trains. Who's operating the trains? They don't stop. They're just on a constant loop. I didn't, I didn't expect there to be a driver for these trains. I just thought they were on autopilot. And if they're not dauntless, they're factionless drivers of the trains. How do, how do they get on and off? Are they jumping off the platform as well? Demonstrating that they could be dauntless. Imagine being made to be a train driver and not even being allowed to stop the train in order to get on and off. And to reward them for all the hard work they're doing as the janitors and garbage collectors, they get paid in food and clothing, but not enough of either. It sort of sounds like the factionless need to unionize and go on strike or something because they're getting a raw deal, especially because they're living in the sewers as well. (laughs) And I'm just thinking like, whoever came up with these rules, with these factions, did they intentionally be like, oh, you know what? We need some people to do the shit work. So we'll just make some factionless people. Like, why would you intend to have a, a lower group in your dream society? If you're trying to make a dream society, why are you already coming in, subjugating people down at the bottom? And they live in poverty doing the work that no one else wants to do. How are abnegation okay with this? Shouldn't they be like trying to put a stop to that if they're really that selfless? So Caleb, Caleb will give up his seat on the bus for someone, but he won't help the garbage collector or the construction worker or, or what? Like, and, and Amity, Amity are all on board. They're the kind ones. And they're like, oh yeah, fuck the factionless. (laughs) Let them live in the sewers. Are you kidding me? And she says it's because they failed to complete initiation. Like, oh, can we not give people a second chance in life? So they're 16 year olds. They say, all right, let's get initiated into Dauntless. They can't accomplish whatever tasks the Dauntless set. And they say, well, you've got a life of poverty ahead of you. Sorry. Ridiculous. And then she says she sees a factionless man standing on the corner up ahead. He wears ragged brown clothing and skin sags from his jaw. (laughs) Okay. And he's like, do you have something I can eat? And she, <laughs> she feels a lump in her throat and a stern voice in her head says, duck your head and keep walking. And she's shaking her head no. So yeah, not a very abnegation oriented response. But then she thinks, you know what? He needs help. I'm supposed to help. And so now she says that she's going to offer him food, not because she wants to, but because she feels like she should just to keep up appearances that she's abnegation. It's like no one else is around. You can... <laughs> You don't have to give this, this factionless guy any bread because like no one else is around. Who are you trying to convince? And like, you already know yourself that you're only a third abnegation. (laughs) So are you trying to convince yourself? Ah, I don't know. Oh wait, no. Then she tells us that her father tells her to keep food in her bag at all times for exactly this reason. So she has this small bag of dried apple slices to offer him under her father's advice. So why was her initial reaction to duck her head and keep walking? if this is something that she's been trained to do all her life. And it's like, hey, you know what, dad, maybe there's a better way to go about this. There's a better way to accomplish homeless outreach than just sending your daughter with a bag of apple slices. Like if you're truly abnegation, maybe you could fix it. And the thing is, I think, because I've read a couple of chapters ahead. I think I'm at chapter seven or something in what I'm reading before I record the pods. But I've read that abnegation are the rulers of the government. Apparently they're the only selfless ones that could be trusted to lead the society. So they're the government members. But it's like, if you're running the government, maybe you could just fix the factionless situation rather than just sending your daughter out with apple slices. Maybe you could do something that's a bit more impactful. Oh, but apparently because factionless people are neither kind 
nor nor honest, nor brave, or any of the other good qualities. He goes to reach for the apple slices, but instead of taking them, he grabs her wrist and then he's smiling creepily at her. And he says, my, don't you have pretty eyes? It's a shame the rest of you is so plain. (laughs) So, okay. Not only is she trying to demonstrate the factionless people are just like morally corrupt. He's, he's called a plain. Isn't that hilarious? Maybe he should be in candor because he's being brutally honest. (laughs) I'm willing to bet that he was raised in candor because what a mean thing to say to a girl who's just trying to give you some dried apple slices. (laughs) It's a shame the rest of you are so plain. Hilarious. And she like tugs her hand back because she's like, ew, get away from me, you bum. (laughs) Remember that scene in Scary Movie where she's like, get away from me, you bum. I'll put the clip in. Well, I'm much more of a people person. I'd like to feed all the hungry little children of the world. I'd much rather help my fellow man than some Spare animal. a dollar? Oh, get away from me, you bum! Buffy, can't you see he's just hungry? Here you go, sir. A nice sandwich for you. See? I said a dollar, bitch! So she says his breath smells unpleasant. And he says, you look a little young to be walking around by yourself. And she's like, hey, I'm older than I look. I'm 16, you know. And it's like, okay, maybe just run. <laughs> You don't need to go and tell this guy who could be a predator that you're 16. But then he smiles at her and he's like, oh, well, then isn't today a special day for you? The day before you choose. So even though he's factionless living in a sewer, doesn't have any food, doesn't have any money, doesn't have a home to live in. Even he's aware that it's it's ceremony day tomorrow. <laughs> like He got the memo. And then she's like, let go of me. A part of me was kind of wishing we were still in the simulation just to see what she would do. But no, apparently this is real life. And she's like, I know what to do. And so she sees the bag of apples flying away from her. So she must throw them at him. And then she hears her running footsteps. So she's visualizing what she's going to do because she hasn't actually done any of that. So how she's hearing it, I don't know. She says, I'm prepared to act. But then he releases my wrist, takes the apples and says, choose wisely, little girl. And that's the end of chapter three. And that's where I'm going to leave it. What What an odd interaction that was. So she's pretty much trying to like, put the idea in that like being factionless is just like the worst thing in the world. You you have to choose a faction and get through initiation. Otherwise you'll be begging for apple slices on the street. But my main question is like, why was she walking on the street anyway? Just cause this Tory bitch said you're divergent and you should go home. Maybe if you don't want to hang out with Caleb, just wait downstairs, just wait downstairs for the bus and go home with Caleb. What? Maybe you should not be walking on the streets alone, the crumbling streets alone past factionless HQ. Maybe avoid that area. She's, she's clearly not erudite. I know she thinks she might be one third erudite, but she's clearly not because that was a dumb move. What do you, what do you guys think of this book? I'm actually really keen to get your thoughts because this was, a, we, we learned a lot in these past three chapters, didn't we? And like, As I said, it it keeps getting more bonkers as we go on. The fact that abnegation run the government, when we get to that, I'm going to have another little conniption because it doesn't make any sense. And I feel like I've said that like 20 times this episode already, just like, doesn't make sense. (laughs) That's so silly. Doesn't make sense. But you're going to be hearing that a lot. So sorry if that bothers you. I'll see you guys next week. Um, And also just a reminder, we've started the Fifty Shades Darker recaps on Patreon and... Divergent's written better. Divergent is much better than Fifty Shades Darker. Hell, the society in Divergent makes more sense than the society in Fifty Shades Darker. It's a horrible, horrible book, but I'm loving recapping it. New episodes every Friday. Just go to patreon.com slash breaking down bad books. It's $3 a month to support the show. And you also get the ad-free bonus episodes every week, every Friday. And yeah, it's a hoot, but I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week. Bye. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations, and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to breakingdownpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at podbreakingdown and Instagram at breakingdownbadbooks. You can visit www.breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch, and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash breakingdownbadbooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading.